Today we're going to be talking about payment reform, and we have three uh, speakers today. So Carrie Comer, who works here at DOH, is going to be kicking us off. Candace Earing from DSHS is going to be speaking, and Travis Erickson from King County is going to also be speaking today. Okay, so as per usual, which some of you will have seen before, we always start off our open spaces by explaining a little bit why we do these. We started our open spaces when Tiffany, Carrie, and I began working under Sue um, in June. I think we, our first one was in September, and we did them to be able to hold a space for people to ask questions about all of these complex topics we're trying to cover with health reform. And so we started with the SIM, uh, the State Innovation Model Investment, so that people really could understand them and get ready to be a part of that grant if we were successful, and we were. So that was, a, a, I think, a good way to start us off. But now we wanted to move in to a different side of health reform to make sure that people were able to understand the things that were outside of the state innovation model. Um, so speaking of the state innovation model, this is one of the graphics um, I heard Dorothy Teeter speak on Friday. This is her, one of her favorite graphics to explain the state innovation model, and it really shows how all of these different sectors of our system work together. And if they're working together well and the gears are aligning, then we're going to have healthier people and healthier communities. So this is really the basis for the state innovation model and our work moving forward and trying to reform our system to be more patient-centered and more human-centered and more community-centered and making sure all of those linkages can happen between those two sectors. And how we're going to do that is through this vision of a healthier Washington. The state innovation model had five different investments that it put forward in a grant to the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare Innovation. We have the strategies that we're going to try to do on the left, the healthy communities, integrated care and social support, and paying for value, and being a state as a first mover. That by, at the state level, sort of putting forward these ideas and this infrastructure and actually emulating the work we want people to do, that the rest will kind of fall in line and continue to do that work as well. The five investments um, are the Accountable Communities of Health, Payment Redesign, Practice Transformation Support, um, Analytic Interoperability and Measurement, and Project Management, which is really the infrastructure for the entire thing to get done. We're also integrating our delivery um, and payment systems, especially our physical and behavioral health system, which Candace is going to talk on, uh, touch on a little bit today. And then additionally, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation actually wanted all of the grantees this time to be able to focus on improving population health, which was a great thing for us to hear. And we have a great basis in the prevention framework. And we will be continuing on that basis to create the plan for improving population health, which we actually hope to have finished in the first year of the grant. That was a commitment we made to CMMI that we would do since we had a good base in the prevention framework. And through doing all of this, we hope to meet our goals of improving population health, transforming delivery systems, and reducing per capita spending. But we don't just operate in a state and innovation model environment. We also have these seven other elements that kind of came out of the Affordable Care Act. And this is our fourth webinar series. We started with insurance and coverage reform. We talked a little bit about delivery system reform and in particular patient-centered care. We last, our last webinar was on technology and data reform and what that's really going to look like, which could have a big impact on the way that public health does its work. Today is about payment reform, which, like, as I said, is very complex, and there's going to be a lot of new terms and ideas thrown at you all. We're going to talk about quality improvement next, and this is quality improvement in both the healthcare sectors, the community sectors, and public health sectors. We're going to try to bring that all together. Workforce development and all the types of different workforces we need to make sure are prepared to operate in the new system. And we're going to end it all with community-based prevention in, in late April. And I'm actually hoping to have um, David from Community-Based Prevention in the Office of Health Communities come and join us for that presentation. So the reason we wanted to bring this slide up so that everyone knows that the base for the Affordable Care Act is really about trying to achieve the triple aim. So one of the uh, the aim for the triple aim is to have better health, to make sure that the health of our populations has actually improved. We also want to make sure that they have the best quality of care that our system can provide. So that's the second aim. And then the third aim is lowering costs. And this is particularly important right now because we're on the brink of bankruptcy for our healthcare system in this country. We spend more than any other industrialized nation in this world, and we need to try to figure out how to lower our costs while also trying to do these other two aims. 
We actually heard uh, the term quadruple aim recently, which included making sure that uh, physicians and clinicians have the support they need to actually operate in this system. And I think when we have always defined it, we have assumed better care would include them to make sure that if they won't be able to provide better care if they're not also supported. But I thought it would be good to bring that up so people kind of have that in the front and center that clinicians also need to make, to make sure they have a place here. And I've already gone through this a little bit, but this touches a little bit more on what those three aims actually do. So you have better health, maybe health promotion. We've talked a lot about health literacy. We've moved in a way we do community-based prevention into a policy systems and environment framework, and we're really focusing, I think our agency is a leader in this country on addressing health disparities and health equity. In better care, we're talking about better coordinated care, care that's safe, effective, patient-centered, and timely, and is also accessible, efficient, and equitable. And then the lowering costs, a lot of what we're talking about is reducing unnecessary services, and also reducing duplication in services, addressing preventable conditions, and treating, um, instead of treating the sick we're actually helping prevent any sickness to begin with, and looking at different ways to pay for care. How can we change the way we pay for care in this country? And that's what we'll talk about today. So our objectives for the payment reform are to provide info on some terms and models related to payment reform, which is really what Carrie is going to jump us off with. And Candace is going to share some great info on integrated Medi uh, Medicaid purchasing and also their project on health homes which will help inform some of this work from a state, statewide perspective. And then Travis is going to give a great example of a public health um, sort of way of approaching payment reform and what that could potentially look like for our future. So we're going to have to do some musical chairs. Bear with us as we hop around. Or you're going to stay there. We're just moving microphones. Never mind. <laughs> so my name is Carrie Comer, and I am the um, Health Systems Operations Lead for Health Systems Transformation and Innovation here at the Department of Health. I think um, just in general, before I really dive into the topic, I want to just remind you this is intended to be a high overview. There's a lot of information. It's very tempting to get into the weeds and give a lot of examples and share too much information because there's so much. So I'm going to spend more of my time focusing on some of the models and terms you're probably hearing and hopefully bringing some clarity to how they might be similar, how they might be different, and what they might look like um, here locally, what they might look like nationally, and where we might see them cropping up over time. So, you know, you're probably wondering, what is payment reform? Um, I think we've heard a lot of different things about what that means. I really like this definition from the Catalyst for Payment Reform. And if you haven't been involved in any of the work through the Catalyst or the CPR, um, they're an organization in California that are really looking at ways to measure and monitor, assess and evaluate um, payment reform activities across the country and then inform a more centralized approach to this or universal or standardized, appro standardized approach to payment reform. So it's a lot of exciting work. But really the, the definition they're using, which I think fits across the models we'll be talking about, is um, payment methods that reflect or support provider performance, especially the quality and safety of care that providers deliver and are designed to spur provider efficiency and reduce unnecessary spending. So um, that's probably not a surprise for most of you, but I think one of the examples I took from this and in, in some of the research I've done is um, really they want to focus on not just on efficiency, but also on quality. Because if you're going to provide a particular service, um, there's a temptation, which we've seen in the 80s, for providers to just kind of shortcut around services or care. Um, that they're really tying it to quality and measures and outcomes in a way that we didn't do back in you know, earlier attempts at reforming payment and delivery. Um, so I think it's important to keep that in mind as we go forward and, um, and hold accountable those people that are um, and those uh, initiatives that are going forward around payment reform. So why do we need it? I mean, I think Caitlin kind of mentioned that she stole some of my glory, but um, you know, our nation spends more money per capita and per um, healthcare spending in general than any other um, nation in the country. We have, as we know this, we, see, we hear this a lot, we don't really get a lot for what we're paying for. So um, when there's no refunds in the current system that we have, and we might be looking at that in the future as more of an incentive or a bonus. And so we're putting a lot of money into a system um, that's unsustainable. And we aren't getting a lot out. And, and it's really across all sectors where the health care system has been 
um, delivering care in a way that is kind of um, cycling back to this kind of uh, broken payment system where you can't get out of that piece of service because there's, it's like an all or nothing approach of what we've been trying. So what we're really looking at doing is trying a, different, a couple different models, seeing what that looks like. You might find your hand in the pot of several models if you're a provider or a hospital or a health system. You're really not in a one size fit all environment. And so I think that's um, one of the things that we're trying to do, and we've recognized the need for that as we have, um, some of the um, SIM models have actually, and the other states have been experiencing and participating and have already given us some information to tell us that one size fit all is probably not gonna work. And Caitlin already covered the triple aim, so I think we're, we're not gonna dive into that further. So I also just wanted to um, kind of just provide more information on these terms you're probably hearing. And they're, it's hard to know if these are concepts or um, just actual terms, but these are really models that pay for performance, outcome-based, and value-based. Um, I'll give you some examples of each of these, but really um, they're kind of used interchangeably. I think depending on what um, kind of system you're in, whether you're a public health system or a, regular, a, a larger health system, a clinic, a provider clinic, um, you might be using outcome-based the same way someone else might be using paper performance. And I think um, CMS may be doing some of that too because the way that they're setting up some of their incentive programs. Um, but you're probably most hearing about this most around this, moving from um, volume to value and really transitioning for fee-for-service to like, patient-centered care or for to um, value-based care. So I just wanted to give you a little bit of um, purpose to why we're going through these models. Um, so some of the projections suggest that the U.S. could save over a trillion dollars in a decade if we were able to really implement these models. And not just one of them, but a variety of them, and really not, again, a one-size-fits-all, but really taking these concepts into account to say, we're working at this, it's got to be pro progressive in a way that's meaningful, and you have to also adapt the delivery system to get there. Um, we've, we talked about the delivery system um, a couple weeks ago, and this is really a hand-in-hand -hand, um, partnership of moving the needle on the system. And so we can't get there without each other. You have to, del to reform the system um, of care and delivery of care with the, the system of payment for care. Some of the models will do that bef um, address delivery of care first, and some will um, address the payment of care first. So I think it just varies. So I just want to give you a quick um, kind of a light example or definition of what each of these mean. Paper performance, and again, these are used very interchangeably. This is really about linking quality to payment. So focusing in on providing financial incentives for improvements and achievements for overall health outcomes. Um, this requires, and as do all of these, like really comprehensive measurement and reporting um, methodologies and capabilities. All of these um, models are going to really be depend on those types of activities and um, the infrastructure to get there. So the example I'm going to use is the Medicare ACOs, the Accountable Care Organizations, through this um, shared savings program through Medicare. Now, um, we are also hearing the paper for, for pay for performance activities going on for the 2015 for Medicare. Um, that is really getting kind of ironed out this year, so we see what that looks like next year. But really, the idea behind the Medicare ACOs is these um, ACOs are be re being responsible for the health outcomes of a specific population. And in the terms of Medicare, it's Medicare clients. So I think we have a really honed in um, population. So. Um, I'm going to move on to the next one for the sake of time, too. So the other one is outcome-based payment. And this is really about best patient outcomes at the lowest possible cost. So this is where we're really going to start tying the cost to outcomes in a way that um, the paper performance is about, about quality and about kind of a system change. This is really about focusing on delivering effective, low-cost, team-based care and reducing waste and duplication and unnecessary services across the system. Again, this will be based on an incentive, um, kind of like a bonus. Um, you know, looking at um, over time, what are the outcomes and they're driving health change? Um, are they driving behavioral change? What does that look like? And then I'm not going to spend a lot of time on value-based payment because I think Candice is also going to touch on this. And I'm going to be sharing more about that in the STEM grant <laughs> coming up. 
Um, so this is really this term we're hearing, moving from volume to value. And, um, and like I said before, this is kind of going from that fee for service um, reimbursement, which means we're going to pay you for each time you um, have a visit or um, order a lab test in a physician world, to we're going to be paying you for actual the health of your population um, and kind of the overall burden of that and the risk, you're taking on the risk of that as well. And so um, this is really, it includes shared savings and incentives for providers, hospitals, and health systems that can demonstrate reduced spending and improved outcomes for their entire population. And I think it's important to keep this in mind, particularly around the Medicaid population as we're going into these testing models coming up and we're considering the managed care organizations that their population are those members within their insurance plan. And so finding some alignment around the actual um, health outcomes and where we kind of direct resources to, say, obesity and chronic disease and things like that where do, where would our role might look like in that and where might it be? So, um, and again, we're also looking at, um, in the Healthier Washington initiative that we'll be talking about, we're really looking at moving 80% of our Medicaid purchasing to, from fee-for-service to um, value-based by 2018. And again, Candace will probably share more of it about that, but I think that's just something important to keep in mind as we're thinking of our future and maybe where we might fit into some of the activities and roles coming up. So I just want to talk a little about terms you've probably heard. So there's this thing, bundled payment. Um, these are really part of the spectrum of different payment reform activities that are, are parts of these models in some cases, and some are just kind of um, independent um, attempts to reduce costs. And, and a bundled payment is actually an attempt to control costs. You're really looking at taking a whole episode of care. We use this often with maternity, like labor and delivery, and um, like surgeries where you're saying this is kind of the request, what is needed for that um, this care outcome or this health outcome and everything is provided at a certain cost or a certain rate with these expectations of services delivered within that rate and then that's dispersed across the system to the providers and the, um, the different parts of the health system that need to make that happen. Um, so we also have in Washington the Bree Collaborative that really informs a lot of this work and makes some priorities and recommendations around um, where we focus our attention on the right services that really are going to make an impact and make a difference and um, um, being bundled in a way that is cost effective. And then there's capitation. And um, this is really based on payments per person and not really about the services. And um, this includes the full cost and risk of all the services provided to treat a person. And that's like professional, facility, pharmaceutical, clinical, laboratory, um, durable medical equipment. I, I, while it's not really stated yet, we're moving towards um, behavioral health, mental, um, uh, mental health, substance abuse. These, these are all things that will be bundled into this idea. Um, and then um, really the, a good example, I think, for public health is really the um, case management model of per, per person per month. And I know Travis is going to talk a little bit about that as well. So I just kind of wanted to key that up a little bit for us. And I didn't change the slide. Well, here you go. Um, so basically, it's one big pot of money to serve the overall health of one person. Um, and then you kind of take a look at that population you're serving to be able to set that up of, here's what it would take to serve my entire population if you're in a health service. And then how would you go about um, negotiating the terms for uh, the cost of that. So um, I'm going to just kind of go between this slide and the next slide to talk about shared risk because um, providers are becoming more and more accountable for the health and the outcomes of their, their patients. And there's a variety of risks. There's this, you have them here, upside only, downside only, and then the two-sided risk. Um, I'm really looking at this, kind of the upside is, you really don't have any financial risk as a provider. You're, um, you're kind of incentive-based or a bonus. If you do these things, um, you'll get more money. If you have better health outcomes, you're looking at specific measurements that you know that you can impact, you'll get paid for that. You're, set, you're setting yourselves up in arrangements with payers to qualify for that, and you're making the attempt that way. Downside risk is you're financially, you're putting money in the kitty, so to say, to say that um, you're going to invest in this as well. So you're going to put some money in up front. You're investing in the future of a system that's going to get you there. And you're held accountable and responsible for that. And you may not get paid back 
um, whether it's through the negotiated um, arrangement with the payer or whatever investment you've put in may not be returned. And then the two-sided risk, which is like an accountable care organization, you're kind of doing both. You're, you're putting those, um, and a lot of times your infrastructure is kind of what you're putting into it. You might have a um, data system or things like that. You're, you're contributing to the system. Um, but you're also looking at um, benchmarks and measurements that you can actually impact and to improve health overall. So um, if those don't go great, you could be at risk. You could either really benefit and get you know, a great incentive or bonus, or you could really um, lose money. And so there's, there's a lot higher risk. And so here's kind of a continuum of that, thinking about kind of that far left is like that low risk. Our current system is really this fee for service. You see someone, you get paid for it, to moving toward this capitated where you really have to have some um, real understanding of the cost of care and the need of care moving forward, not just for today, but moving ahead. Like how do you, you don't really want to bank it on what you are delivering today. You want to deliver it on where you see the health system going as well. Um, so being able to really have that foresight and really that um, accountable care program is kind of a progression of getting there. So we are going through some of that shared risk. We're going through um, to get to that capitated rate. Um, so, so I think that we'll um, see more and more of these type of the right side of this image um, cropping up as we move through um, delivery form and payment reform. So I know that was kind of fast, um, but hopefully we'll have time at the end for questions. And I'm taking longer. Um, so I also just wanted to call out some of the impacts of payment reform that we are already seeing and some that we expect to see. So for consumers, you know, we're expecting them to start choosing higher um, quality and higher value providers um, based on these new models. If they're going to provide us to be held more accountable, we want our consumers to understand that and use that to their advantage to access the best quality of care. They will help shape the market where we're going to become more competitive and become more accountable. Um, we're also seeing provider consolidation. Um, we, we probably hear about this a lot, a lot in the news even. Um, bigger health systems are kind of grabbing up smaller systems and making them even larger. And so that's actually um, impacting the co competitiveness around our um, health systems. So um, insurers, for example, don't have as much bargaining power or negotiation power when you're only dealing with a few health systems in a region or in a county. And then um, just in terms of health policy, I, we have concerns. Is ACA going to stick around? Um, there's a question of a repeal regularly. And some people, I would say the reason we have been slow to uptake some of these new practices has been the concern of, is it really going to stick around? Can we invest in something that's not going to stay? So what are we doing that can help contribute to the stability of the Affordable Care Act and health reform that can make sure people can really invest in it back? And then try uh, price transparency um, to the all payers, all payers claim database. Um, I think this is a great opportunity for um, health systems, public health, and consumers to really understand how their data is being used to drive change, um, to improve health care, and to improve their own health, and drive competition in the health system. So um, again, I'm kind of running through. I also just wanted to talk about some things you're probably seeing here in Washington. Um, so patient-centered care, this isn't new to most of us here in public health and certainly Department of Health where we're talking about the medical home, the health home model. Again, um, Kenneth will be talking to this more. We have the win work here. Um, we're just getting ready to um, implement the practice transformation support system as part of the uh, Healthier Washington initiative. And there's a lot of exciting work there how we really transform the delivery system to support where we're going. And with that work, the impacts of the payment system will be included in that. So where do we align with those initiatives? And then um, paying for performance. The Apple Health contract for managed care for Medicaid, they're really building this in. They have some measures in there already. We intend to expand that um, accountability for managed care to really be looking at um, particular um, prevention measures that that we can actually um, base the health of our community on. I talked a little bit about the bundled payments of the Bree Collaborative. There's a lot of activity going there. And then um, like our 2016 PEB pro, um, plan here for state employees, um, we'll be having an accountable care network, which is going to be like a narrow, a narrower network than we're used to in a PPO plan. Um, 
we'll be reducing costs. It's more of a cost control. We're really contracting out to say, you're going to serve this population, this much of the population for this much money, and what does that mean in our return on investment for that? This is another one of our tests. Can we do this? Will it be effective? Will people buy into it? That's another, another test. Um, I've heard people say, there's no way I'm giving up my PPO. Well, how close can we get to the quality of services and care in a narrow network that we might not be so worried about giving up from a PPO? And then I'm just going to talk a little bit about, and, and a very little bit about the um, payment redesign model through Healthier Washington. So um, there are four models that we're going to test in the STEM work. Um, and really the first one is about um, Medicaid integration of uh, physical and behavioral health. This is um, this early adopter um, model that we're looking at. I mean, people in that are ready to integrate services for physical and mental health for um, that whole person care. And it's just testing out what does it take to do that? Who has infrastructure in place to get going? And for that, you'll get some bonuses or incentives. You get money back if you're ready to roll. And so we'll start um, seeing some progression of that over the next few years. The second is encounter-based to value-based. So we talked about this fee-for-service working with the uh, federally qualified health um, systems and the rural health and then the um, critical access hospitals to say, what can we learn from what you're doing in a, a more value-based system? How can we make your care more valuable and more value-based? And um, what's working, what's not working? And here's some like more innovative and progressive ideas to advance this even further. Um, and I just talked about our PEB plan, like you know, really looking at we kept making it more accountable for our health at a lower cost. And then there's the greater Washington multi-payer. This is really bringing in more payers from our health system to you know, move 80% of our health purchasing and the cost of our health care to um, a value-based system. So with that, I know it's a lot. <laughs> um, I am going to, we're going to do some shuffling. I'm going to invite Candy over from um, VSHS. She is the office chief for the Office of Service Integration Behavior Health and Service Integration Administration from DSHS. And she's going to talk to us a little bit more about some of the exciting um, and innovative health reform that's going on over there. Well, thank you, and, and good morning. So what I would like to talk to you about are just two specific examples of, um, of initiatives and planning that are underway um, in light of payment reform. One of these opportunities has come through the Affordable Care Act, and one was through legislation last year. So hopefully these will provide some examples for you of what Carrie was just speaking to. Um, so next slide. Thank you. So the Affordable Care Act did provide opportunities for states to participate um, in initiatives that would help transform the health care delivery system. And one of those is detailed in Section 2703 of the Act, and the name of the program is Health Homes. And this has caused um, some confusion, minor probably, but some, because of the work that the Department of Health has been doing with patient-centered medical homes or patient-centered health homes. But these are different from um, a clinic-based service. So think about the delivery of services outside of a physician or a, a clinic-based setting. And that's the kind of health home service that we're talking about. So this program, this opportunity of funding support through the Affordable Care Act, allows us to provide a model of comprehensive care management and care coordination, not only to people who are Medicaid-only eligible, but people who are also what we call dually eligible, they are uh, receiving uh, insurance through both Medicare uh, and Medicaid. And that's a unique opportunity for the state to provide. Thank you. So our implementation for uh, health home services was through what are called state plan amendments. So if any of you have worked for health care authority or DSHS, this is the way the state proposes to the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services what kind of programs we want to deliver, who is eligible, and what are the services. So in the Affordable Care Act, in this particular opportunity related to payment reform, uh, every state could define what the population was going to be, 
and you could also define by geography who was going to receive those services, which is very unique for a state plan service. Usually state plan services are statewide. But this did give states that ability to say, we will only do this in one county. We'll only provide this for people who have a certain chronic condition. Our approach in Washington was to phase this in. So we took two slices of geography, if you will. Phase one covered three of our coverage areas in the state, and that was in July of 2013. And our second phase added three additional coverage areas. So we're in 37 of 39 counties right now with health home services, uh, excluding King and Snohomish County, uh, because we were planning on doing another demonstration in those two counties that has now um, not, uh, we haven't been the had the ability to implement that, but we're working on expanding statewide for health homes. So we've built a structure of lead entities, which are managed care plans and community-based organizations, and then care coordination organizations. So we have eight leads who have contracts with the state, and those eight leads then have contracts with care coordination organizations, and we have about 71 of those organizations uh, located statewide. They get paid a capitated payment, so that's one of the uh, payment models that Carrie spoke to. So they get a per person per month payment for every month that they provide a health home service. So it's capitated and it includes their travel, it includes documentation time, it includes home visit time, it includes all the administrative costs um, to delivering health homes, and we have three different levels of payment. So there's three capitations depending upon uh, the service that's being provided to an individual. Next slide. So about the who is eligible for health home, not all of our Medicaid or duly eligible beneficiaries are eligible for health home services. We learned through some earlier chronic care management models that we implemented that we can get the best return on our investment in providing care management to people who are our highest risk Medicaid beneficiaries. So there are literally hundreds of thousands of people in Washington State who may have diabetes as one of their chronic conditions. But there are also many people with diabetes who manage that very, very well. And so we didn't want to necessarily spend our scarce resources on people who are doing well at managing their diabetes, but rather target those individuals who are at higher risk related to diabetes. And typically, they have many co-occurring uh, chronic conditions. And we very much have to engage the beneficiary in improving their health. This is a, a voluntary program. So I could offer it to everyone on the panel here today, and some of us would say, yes, I'm ready, and yes, this is something I'm interested in. And others would say, no, no, thank you. I'm not ready or I'm not interested. And that's really OK. It's not right or wrong. It's not good or bad. It's about people being ready to engage in improving their health. Uh, the prison risk score. So this is another aspect of payment reform, um, if you will, that we've developed here in Washington State Prism is an acronym for the Predictive Risk Intelligence System. It was developed and is operated by DSHS Research and Data Analysis Division. And it looks at past experience, 15 months previous experience, to predict your future risk. So insurance carriers uh, and the state use risk scoring to help determine populations that may benefit from uh, targeted services. And that's how we're using the PRISM uh, risk score. So a score of 1.5 sounds like a relatively small number in terms of risk. But when we stratify the population and we put all the 1.5 million Medicaid beneficiaries in the state into this calculation, about 50,000 of those 1.5 million come up with a risk score of 1.5 or greater. So people will, would think on a, on a scale of 0 to 100 that 1.5 you have uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of people in there, but you don't. You have about 50 to 60,000 people on any given day who are in that risk group, and those are the individuals that are eligible to receive health home services, and that's both adults and children. Right. So here's the laundry list of the services that uh, we provide through Health Home Services. So it's comprehensive care management. That's the development of a health action plan 
and the administration of screenings to individuals. So we want to know what their level of depression is. Uh, we do a BMI. We also screen people and ask them a questionnaire about their level of activation. So what are their knowledge, skills, and abilities around making healthcare decisions? It's critically important for that care coordinator or that care manager to understand where this person is in terms of their ability to make healthcare decisions. So that's a glimpse into comprehensive care management. We provide the care coordination, so we don't replace any systems of care that are already providing services, whether it's through a managed care plan or a fee-for-service. We bridge those services together. We also are required to provide transitional care follow-up, so someone discharged from a hospital or a skilled nursing facility or a psychiatric inpatient stay, we help to provide that transitional support back home. We provide patient and family support, community and social service support, um, and then we use an electronic health action plan. We do not have an electronic health record that links perhaps their clinic, their mental health agency, their substance use disorder clinic. That's down the road. That's work that's being developed. But their health action plan is, a, is an electronic uh, document. Slide. So our investment um, in health home services um, is uh, on average about $180 per person per month. So whether an organization and an individual sees someone 10 times in a month and makes 10 contacts or one time in a month, that payment is the same to that organization. Um, and that was derived through a calculation with an actuary that averages out those costs. So for those of you who have been on the delivery side, you know that you've always had some patients or clients who um, you overextend, uh, you know, the payment, if you will, that you received, and some people who you're doing okay on that payment. So it averages out um, over the, the course of the year. And our health home program was really an early um, a model delivery system that we developed and took advantage of the opportunity of health homes to build a PMPM. We'll be looking at outcomes, again, as um, Carrie um, talked about, value-based. Uh, we will be looking at hospitalization rates. I think we can go to the next slide. Yeah, we'll be looking at hospitalization utilization. We'll be looking at emergency department utilization. We actually want to see an increased use in long-term services and support. Uh, we know that many individuals, when we're thinking about social determinants of health, housing, personal care needs, um, um, IADLs, cognition, um, intellectual disabilities, that using long-term services and support can actually have an impact on the health care cost. So for example, a real simple example, if someone is falling, getting in and out of the bathtub because they have the late effects of a stroke, and they're ending up in the emergency room in the hospital with brain injury and fractures, um, we can spend money on providing support for bathing and grooming and help reduce the impacts of falls and injury. We are also measuring improved quality of life. And then we actually also want to see an increase in access to primary care. Rather than people going to the emergency department when it's not needed, going into the hospital when they're sicker, rather than getting them in there on time um, is certainly a goal of our health home program. Previous programs that we've had have shown a return on investment. It's a one to uh, five. So for every uh, 50 cents, there's a return of a dollar. And we're hoping to replicate that return on investment with this health home program. But we're um, still at least a couple of years out from being able to do a really robust evaluation um, of the impact of this program. So that's one model uh, of payment reform that uh, we've delivered in Washington. And then I'm going to talk to you briefly about behavioral health organizations. So this was legislation, you can go to the next slide, that was passed uh, last session. Um, and the legislature authorized the formation of what are called behavioral health organizations. And it directed the state to purchase care through regional service areas. And in a couple of slides, I'll show you a map of what those regional service areas are. But that's one of the steps in Washington State towards payment reform and, and regional service areas that will be part of purchasing. So by April 1 of 2016, this is the day that would be a good day to take a vacation. This is when early adopters are supposed to roll out. This is when BHOs will <laughs> come online. So maybe we'll all plan a cruise that day. Um, but 
DHOs begin in the regional service areas that do not pursue the early adopter option. And so far, one, one regional service area is pursuing early adopter, um, and the other nine uh, uh, regional service areas are pursuing uh, becoming behavioral health organizations. So there will be outcome measures. There are outcome measures that Department of Health and Healthcare Authority and DSHS are working on defining. Um, and the goal is that by January 2020, there will be full integration of behavioral health and medical health to Medicaid enrollees. Next slide. So here's um, a high-level overview of the elements of a BHO. I am going to move really quickly through these. But it is not the integration of medical care. That's probably the greatest distinction to keep in mind between early adopters and BHOs. It is, for the first time, uh, combining the substance use disorder and mental health services that were provided through the regional service network into an organization that's called a behavioral health organization. And that will cover an entire uh, regional service area. There will be capitation rates to the BHO to cover the cost of both of these services. Um, there are many work groups. I was telling Travis that there are many people at DSHS, uh, and specifically my administration, that are working on the development of behavioral health organizations. And it's critically important that we include housing, employment, education, things that really matter to people when they think about their health care and their health care delivery, is I have a safe place to live, I, I have a job, um, I have friends and family. And so those are really critical elements when you think about um, people's well-being. Next slide. So the timeline, we're working on the development of rates um, and rate changes and the impacts of those to both mental health um, and chemical dependency contractors. Um, and then those rates are set to be released um, in, the, in the next week um, out to um, our contractors. Next. And next. Uh, so, again, regional service areas uh, have been established, and they were established through um, legislation, again, in 2014. And these are areas. They're not providers. They're not networks. But they're geographic boundaries um, that have at least 60,000 people on Medicaid in the region and provider capacity to provide uh, medical and behavioral health services. And the next slide is um, the map itself. And this map is available on Healthcare Authority's website if you're interested in getting a copy of this um, and having this available to you. You can't see um, on the overhead, I don't think, the actual county by county um, names um, of these regional service areas. But this is, this is where DOH will be working with your practice transformation hub and liaison out to these regional service areas. These will become the accountable communities of health, and these are the regional service areas. Uh, for purchasing and payment. So that concludes my portion, and I'm going to hand it over to Travis now. I also just want to thank um, Candace. I know she's going to have to pop out early, so if you see her going, um, she has another engagement. But uh, I'd also like to just introduce you to more time. So um, I'm very excited to introduce you to Travis Erickson. He's the Healthcare Transformation and Implementation Manager at Public Health Seattle and King County. And um, I really invited him today so he could give some examples of what um, payment reform and somewhat delivery reform might look like from a local health perspective and some of the work they've been um, getting underway in King County that may be um, replicated across the state with some of the initiatives they've come up with. So with that, go ahead and take it away, Travis. Thank you, Carrie. Um, thank you, Candice. Uh, for those in attendance and on the phone, um, I appreciate the opportunity to be with you today. I'm cognizant of the time. We'll do my best to get through the slides before the top of the hour. Um, next slide. Real, um, go ahead. Real quick, just a quick agenda, as you can see on the presentation here. We're going to talk a little bit about the impact of uh, local health departments and public health departments pre and post ACA implementation some approaches to engaging managed care organizations, and then I'm going to take a little bit of time to just talk about the unique opportunities that my organization, Public Health Yalkin County, has done in engaging with managed care organizations. Um, a little bit of housekeeping before, as I begin. When I reference managed care throughout this presentation, I'm specifically talking about Apple Health Carriers. Um, obviously, there are a great longitude of what we call managed care, but for the purpose of this presentation will be Apple Health. 
Uh, I also, if, if you see agencies listed on my slide, it's not meant to be all inclusive. It's just meant to be representative of the agencies that um, are potentially impacted. And then part of this is from the public health Gallatin County point of view. Um, very cognizant that different health departments and different LHJs are set up differently in terms of capacity and services. And um, we're not, this is not meant to be prescriptive of what all LHJs should do, but can certainly be opportunities to think about ways to engage with managed care. So <clears throat> real quickly, prior or pre-ACA, excuse me, um, really before 2014, uh, there was really limited uh, alignment with managed care from a, a, from a public health department. We had a lot of statewide programs that were being implemented. Many of them were overseen by various state and uh, federal agencies. Uh, but in the most part, we basically had a lot of siloed programs that were unaligned. Uh, we were offering a lot of pockets of excellence, but we never didn't necessarily have agencies of excellence working on things. Uh, and the programs were basically guided by the funders and the grants uh, that they were that they were responsible for. This unfortunately not only caused a lot of infrastructure silos, it caused a lot of unaligned execution, various unaligned evaluation, uh, unaligned payment has been discussed earlier, and then basically having to have each individual program or service kind of promote and be individual on their own to to get the support and services that they need. Next slide. Uh, the great thing, of course, was that the uh, PAPACA was implemented, and that basically changed the whole world of healthcare delivery. Uh, I think everything got turned on its side or on its head, and we really had to take a look at what the new landscape was going to offer. Uh, there was a lot of things that were going on, not just in the personal delivery of healthcare, has been alluded to, but I think if you look at a lot of the changes that were happening in our state, just in state alignment, we had various agencies starting to align differently because we realized that the ACA was consolidating funding, consolidating programs, consolidating services. Um, so you have the HCA, DSHS, and the Department of Health, just to name a few, working probably in different ways and in more integrated ways than maybe we have in the past. Uh, unfortunately for our state, we also had Medicaid expansion. This not only brought uh, more enrollees to our state uh, Medicaid ranks, but it also brought greater benefits. Um, greater networks of providers getting linked into this because there was this uh, tide and this current change of realizing that this was a new way in which you were going to have to be a participant in, in health delivery. Uh, managed care organizations became a, a strong staple. Um, prior to this, we did have managed care organizations with Medicaid, but I think post-ACA, uh, Washington has definitely proved that we are a Medicaid managed care organization state. Um, and those managed cares or those MCOs are accountable for a great deal of deliverables than ever before, not just in providing the services and the benefits to their members, but in terms of maintaining proper networks, uh, reaching very quality aims, and providing the robust services such as health homes that was alluded to earlier. Uh, and the last thing that really kind of hit at some of this was some of those individual programs and services that maybe uh, public health departments or local health jurisdictions were implementing the funding from those at a federal level, various grants and, and private funding opportunities were starting to be shrunk. Many of this hap happened to be uh, a part of uh, many of these benefits being wrapped into state Medicaid benefits and alignments at the federal level, but we started to see the dissipation of some of these um, other sources for funding. Next slide. So what this, uh, to continue on with the current environment post-ACA, what this really does is it caused a lot of reductions in our services. Many of our programs that we offer um, especially in King County, we were seeing that many of our sources were drying up in terms of how robust and the, and the footprint that we could really execute in those counties. So we were having reductions in services and, and facing some of those challenges. Um, I think throughout the state, this caused a lot of health departments and a lot of health jurisdictions to make some historic decisions. We were really having to decide how much can we reduce or can we eliminate or do we need to eliminate, excuse me, various programs and services because our sources of funding have, are not sustainable, are not the same as they were prior to the implementation of the ACA. And I think a lot of this led to the last bullet there, which is the uncertainty and misalignment um, that this caused in various uh, opportunities for us. I think a lot of, uh, and no fault to any, any entity, I think it was just a victim of circumstances that as the Affordable Care Act got implemented, I think a lot of health departments woke up and realized, wow, the world did change and it is different. And we may not have done the best job we could at coordinating as a state group of health departments and health jurisdictions to be prepared for that. And that left a lot of us kind of 
isolated and having to operate under our own assumptions and our own efforts to, to stabilize accordingly. So in public health, uh, Seattle King County, and in, I know many other areas, what that led to because of the new world and one of the stabilizing forces was managed care. Um, it became very apparent that managed care was going to be uh, a new payer, a new procurer of services and the programs that we offered prior to the ACA. And so you now needed to realize how to engage with this new significant partner. Um, one of the ways that Public Health Seattle King County took that on was we basically did a couple of kind of step therapy through this. The first was really to figure out how we fit in to this new post-ACA world. Uh, we took a lot of, we took a long look at all the programs and services that we offered, um, regardless of the funding, uh, and really figured out how could these programs better align, better share information, better coordinate outcomes um, and infrastructure so that we could, we could not work in so much silos, but really work across an entire public health department and look at all the services that we offer and, and how they may be beneficial to managed care. The second thing, and this is, um, Unfortunate for for uh, for ourselves, I um, I, ha I come from managed care, so I had a unique perspective in terms of the background there. But we really took the time to understand what the managed care organizations need and want. Um, they obviously have a ton of requirements that they have to adhere to as well through state contracts. And so we took the time to really read the Apple Health contract word for word and realize what were the specific things that they a have to offer to the members in terms of benefits and networks. And then how do we fit into that and, and try to really understand the constraints and the pressures that they had. Um, once we've done that, we tried to evaluate through that prior step all the services and programs that we had and figured out how could we come to them with kind of a needs analysis, value-based opportunity for them. Where did we see the potential for our current programs or former programs to blend into this new world of health delivery that the managed care organizations were accountable for? And finally, we, take the, we took the time to engage them. Uh, I think we realized that with these ever-changing worlds, and we're only 15 or 16 months into ACA, uh, it's really about building relationships with managed care. It takes time to meet the new people who are going to run these programs, both on the public health side and at the managed care organization side, uh, realize the different business constraints and challenges that they have, and really uh, just take the time to learn one another I think one of the biggest opportunities we took in 2014 was to really educate managed care about the unique work and scope and depth and value of services that public health has always brought to the communities in which they operate in. Um, and so that type of relationship building and education uh, was really worth its value and time in terms of fostering those relationships. Next slide. So what that has led to for public health of Seattle King County, and again, um, I'm very cognizant that we might be a unique op or um, public health department in terms of the robust scope of services that we offer. But we uh, currently, as I sit here today, we're currently contracted with all five Apple Health carriers in King County for the delivery of the services um, that we offer at our public health centers. This includes primary care, family planning services, um, along with various behavioral health and pharmacy services at all of our public health centers. We also, in the spirit of Candace's presentation, we've also engaged with some NCOs in some transitional care and care coordination services, kind of mini health home or, or health home-like arrangements. Um, what we did here is we looked at the value and the unique opportunity that our children with special health care needs program offered to its community, and we really took that expertise and kind of leveraged it because we saw that these NCOs had a need to provide health home or very similar services to children and adolescents. And so we're partnering with them on that, those types of opportunities. Um, we also, in the 2015 contract, there's some unique language that the managed care organizations are accountable to uh, refer those that are eligible to various MSS and first start, first steps, excuse me, programs. And so while well, there's no contractual arrangement there, we're looking to really leverage our unique skills and create more of a succinct and sound referral program between Public Health of Seattle King County and the managed care organizations so that we can be the entity that provides those services to those applicable clients in our county. Uh, our prevention unit of public health has uh, been working with a couple of managed care plans and a grant that we uh, achieved through a PCORI Foundation to really test the uh, foundational approaches to managing asthma that the county and the public health department has always promoted and really using that as a way to let managed care see a different way of approaching this chronic condition. And we're using that as a testing ground to um, 
to not only test managed care organization enrollees in this pilot, but then the managed care organizations are, are basically learning a new way to approach and manage this disease, un, uh, different than what their internal disease management programs may be offering. So it's, it's another great way in which these two, our two entities are coming together to figure out and bring our unique expertise around asthma management um, and come up with a more robust community program around this. Uh, and finally, we're looking at some integration work in the spirit of the behavioral health organizations that were lended, uh, um, earlier alluded to. We have a unique clinic out at Novels Mental Health where we have a primary care center embedded in that. And we're using that as a, an opportunity to approach managed care to truly test full integration in kind of a quasi-early adopter mode. Uh, and then we're starting to look, uh, there's been a lot of work in the last year around utilizing the community health workers and other consulting services and that the public health department might offer in terms of our robust expertise in various programs and outreach and linkages to social determinants of health and how we can assist MCOs in putting those programs in place. Next slide. So the next steps that I would offer to those in attendance and those on the webinar would be really take a look at your internal health department and determine what is the level of interest to engage with MCOs in your, in your service area. Um, review your capacity and your opportunities. Don't just look at the current programs and services that you might have, but take a look at maybe programs that have been shrunk or eliminated in the last five to ten years and see if there's a way to revamp those through some unique arrangements. In the spirit of payment reform, these managed care organizations are definitely interested in finding ways to fund and support programs that can bring value to their, to their members. Um, talk to MCOs. Get out there and educate them about the unique services that you've always provided in your counties and in your regions so that they truly understand. You would be amazed how many managed care organizations do not fully understand how local health departments or local health jurisdictions work. They really don't understand the robust scope and breadth of services that we provide to our citizens. And then get on the phone or get in webinars or get in other learning groups and talk with other local health jurisdictions and public health departments. Um, my contact information will be shared at the end. I'd be more than happy to speak with anybody about the unique opportunities that we have and see of other ways to learn. I'm always looking for exciting new possibilities and, and just brainstorm with other departments on ways we can engage. The, the common consistency is that if you're going to work with the, the highest need um, population, which I believe most health departments do, managed care organizations or those Apple Health carriers are going to be those that, that have those membership. And so finding ways to engage with them and really truly see them as a valuable relationship partner moving forward, uh, I think is worth your time. I believe that's all I have. Well, thank you, everyone. We're going to, I think, shut it down now. And I appreciate Travis and Candace for coming today and for you all of you coming in the room. So thank you. See you in a couple weeks.